everyone and welcome to another session of our VCI and cloud uh, stream. So today we have our co-host and speaker and now becoming like a partner, uh, Zig Ziga. Uh, it's our third uh, session, Zig. I believe it's very uh, exciting and informative sessions and thank you for being with us and allocating the time and uh, experience, knowledge to share with everyone. Today we have a very exciting uh, title. I believe we, when we were thinking about it, I said, why not to make it like a bit catchy, learn how to architect cutting edge data center. Do you want to comment or uh, yeah, welcome I'll, everyone? I'll, <laughs> yeah, a commentable thing, right? So yeah. it's a pleasure, Mohammed. I, I actually think we're having more fun than everyone else on these webinars. Um, I think we're having a, a ball putting the content together. Um, going back and forth, and then actually, you know, hosting the webinar. So I think we've been having a really good experience. Um, and and honestly, for the the attendees, we've had some really great interactions over the last couple of months. So I'm hoping today we keep that going. Right? It's all about interactions. It's all about helping you guys. Right? It's it's not about helping Muhammad and I. Like we we kind of know this technology. We've done this stuff right from a design perspective. But we're really here to help you. Um, the title, right? Learn how to architect cutting edge data centers. It's a little catchy, but that's really what we're trying to do for you, right? We're really trying to make your data centers cutting edge. Um, so I think I think the content that we're going to cover today is really going to hit that mark. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, and uh, as we mentioned, try to make it as as interactive as possible. And as we said, uh, we are trying to lay the foundation layer by layer. So we talked about data center how to uh, data center interconnect last session. Today we'll talk about the new trend. Next session we'll start talking about how to start thinking about private cloud, public cloud, how to interconnect your data center with the hyperscaler and public cloud like AWS, uh, Microsoft and so on. So, and we'll keep growing from there. Um, just to, to kick it directly, Zig, if we go to the agenda, We'll do, we'll do. Um, so we're gonna hit the agenda real quick, right? But I just wanna make sure, like Mohammed said, um, and we've said it a couple of times, um, interactivity, right? We need this to be interactive. That's how we're all gonna get value out of this today. So if you have questions, please unmute yourself. Feel free to ask any question. No question is a question. Um, you know, we're here to help you. So ask your questions, give us your design situation, and we'll help you every step of the way. If for some reason you can't ask the question on the audio, feel free to put it in chat. And we will read it and we'll we'll kind of go over it on, on the webinar. 100%. Yeah, so the agenda, we'll, as we know, I was discussing with Zig, we'll try to give you more like an architect and designer, how, what to consider and why you need to go for this cutting edge uh, data center. And don't let the catchy title mislead you. We don't build a cutting edge data center just to be like a leading edge or like being the pioneers. We always need to link it to a business case. So we need to use technology for the business benefit or for the customer benefit. I believe you agree, Zig. That's why I like the when you start thinking about the agenda, you started why and then the business use cases before talking about technology. Yeah, yeah. So um, you hit the, the nail on the head there, Mohammed, right? So um, I think I'm going to go on a soapbox as always, right? I, I'm going to do my own thing here. And I think as an industry, we don't learn about why we do things uh, early enough. You know, we're told to do certain designs and certain implementations. And it's really, you know, a technology specific implementation. And we don't know why we're doing it. Um, and, and if you are in that same boat, you know, you can resonate with that a little bit, I think. Um, now, for me, my my mindset shifted, right? When I went over and took the, the CCDE, the Cisco Certified Design Expert Certification, and more importantly, that whole journey that I, I went through personally, my mindset shifted from doing technical design, like um, best practice and designing a solution because I felt like it was the best, um, to more about why, right? Why are we doing these things? Um, and, and what is in it for the business, right? Because again, every design that every design decision that we make has to tie to a business requirement or business business constraint, business priority, and a, even a business use case. Every single design decision has to do that. 
Um, so this is really dear to me, right? And we'll go to the next slide, if that's cool with you, Mohammed. And, uh, the, you know, as we design things, we have to ask why, right? And, and I'll even talk about preconceived notions for a minute. If you're not familiar with what a preconceived notion is, um, it's like a, an idea in your head that you apply because you like it or because you have some ex uh, event that happened in your experience that makes you like that technology or that design. I'll give you a quick specific example. I'm a big fan of EIGRP, right? So that IGP, that routing protocol. And I inherently want to use EIGRP everywhere. It's just a driver in my head. Now, it took me, it took me a long time to know, hey, I, I'm putting EIGRP here. It doesn't make sense. I need to use OSPF or I need to use BGP. Um, that's a preconceived notion. So we can't we can't design something just because we like it. We have to design something that ties back to all the requirements of both business, technical, application requirements. All right, I'm off my soapbox now. I'm sorry, guys. No, no, Andre, really interesting and really, I feel very excited and motivated when I listen to you, Zig. And just thinking something came to my mind, maybe while we're working, so while we're doing this today, we have we have discussed eight new trends. So maybe we can open it like a game or like a competition. After we finish each, each technology, we'll ask the audience, what is the main business benefit and why do you think we can use this? So let's uh, practice this today. And, see I, I like that. and just so the guys, everyone knows uh, on, yeah. on the webinar, we didn't plan that, right? So that, that is just <laughs> a new thing we're going to do for the webinar. And I think it's a great idea, right? We'll yeah. ask you guys what you guys think for each of these technologies we covered today. Yeah, great. So let's jump in to All the right. yeah, slide. So so we talked about why, right? Um, for a, a little bit, I, I went on my soapbox, right? So um, I'm going to ask you all why do we need a data center architecture? You know? So I'm going to let you guys answer. Again, feel free to unmute yourselves. Feel free to answer in chat. Um, but why do we need a data center architecture? I warned you it's going to be interactive. I warned you. Yeah. Well, if no one else has an idea, uh, I'll ask Mohammed, right? So, um, Mohammed, why do we need a data center architecture? Why, in your opinion, in your perspective, do we need a data center architecture? Yeah, yeah. As we mentioned, because the architecture and architect is like, for me, like a bridge. He's the one trying to translate the business requirement into a technical blueprint or a roadmap. So imagine yourself trying to build your house without a blueprint, without an architect. It's for sure it will fail. Uh, or you will discover something after you start, oh, I need four bedrooms. I actually built two. So you will uh, destroy <laughs> everything you did and start start again. I'm, I'm just finished building my house, so that it was a dilemma. So <laughs> you need to plan first. And for us as an network and technical engineers, we need to first think about business requirement, business problem we're trying to solve, or even if there's no problem for the best and world or euphoria, we need to uh, provide more benefits or make the business thrive and, uh, and grow. So this is for me the main uh, reason to go for architect. If anybody else has I believe Tony, he put something in the chat. So we got a few things in chat. So we got um uh uh, uh can, I'm not gonna pronounce your name right. I'm sorry, Tesos, I think maybe. Uh, because we need to to build a DC. Um, and then we got Sarav uh, for planning and feature scaling according to application needs. I like that. This applications, right? So the the purpose of a data center is really to host something. Uh, applications, services, and those applications or services are really tied to a business problem or a business uh, requirement, right? It could be an application that's for your users, your customers. It could be your own application for your IT teams or your network teams. Uh, it could be because you're trying to make money as, as a business, right? And th th on, on this slide here, it all comes down to the business problems that we're trying to solve, right? Again, we're always gonna tie it back to the business. So why are we building a DC architecture? Because we're solving a business problem, right? And we're gonna cover a few of those business problems on the next slide. 
can anyone give me an idea what a business problem that we'd be trying to solve with um with a data center we got some more chats so i'm just going to read some of these off if you guys don't mind so shanar said to help customers drive meet their business uh sorry goals serve workload storage applications internal external that is perfect right on uh rafi said need to know current it state it constraints um future state and set up the baseline um was someone going to talk i'll let you guys talk go ahead no okay we got a few more comments and then i'm going to go on to the next question here we have two questions so uh proof uh said latency and cost rajath said scalability reliability Sita said to deliver enterprise applications and Osama said CapEx, OpEx. Those are all great business problems, right? We're going to cover a few of those in a minute. Um, so I always put this question on this slide, right? And I, I, I harped on why, but as designers, as architects, whatever word you resonate for, right? Um, I, you know, designers and architects can be kind of synonyms, if you will. If, if you're a designer, you should be asking why. And it's not always a technical why. It's a why to the business, right? I'll give you a quick example of what I mean. Um, application teams usually say, or applications development teams, coders, right? Um, programmers, they usually say they need layer two connectivity between their servers. I ask why. Why do you need layer two connectivity between your servers? Or a better one, I get the same application teams and say, I need a hard coded IP address in my application. And I say, why? Why do you need to do these things? These are bad decisions, right? I'm not a fan of layer two connectivity if we don't need it. I prefer not to do layer two connectivity. And I don't, I don't, there's no valid reason to hard code an IP address at an application, right? So we have to push back as architects, as designers, we have to push back. Mohammed, anything else to add on that before? No, 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 hundred percent. I I really enjoyed and liked most of the comment, uh, uh, all the comments here about the reasoning. Uh, also, something important. So we know that network is changing, um, uh, IT completely changing a lot, and every company, the IT is becoming one of the major arms of the company to grow and to get more customers. So. We need also to consider that some of the business owners, application owners, and even the marketing team, they were a bit suffering in order to deploy a new application. It took them maybe a few uh, months, if not a year or so. So also one of the key requirements for the these new trends is what we call it to enhance and improve time to market. If I have an idea and I want to build it, I don't want the network team to tell me, I need uh, one month to lay the switch, two uh, weeks to configure the VLANs, and so on. If we try to achieve better time to market through uh, simple first, try to make the architecture simple, programmable, uh, real-time visibility, all these also are a key business factors to build a, a cutting-edge data center to uh, help the business achieve their goals. Back to you, Zig. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right on, Mohammed. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm. And I, I will also comment. I, I think that the chat interaction's been great, guys. Keep it up. This is outstanding, right? Again, if you feel comfortable on unmuting yourselves and talking uh, on the webinar, feel free to do so. We don't lock the, the mute button, right? So that's all on you guys to unmute yourself and, and mute yourself when you're done talking. We don't, we don't, we don't govern that, right? So I'm gonna keep going. I can talk. I'm very winded at times. So. Um, so let's talk about those business problems, right? And we have eight here. These, this is not an all-inclusive list, mind you, right? And, and as you go through and design solutions and talk to customers and talk to your organizations, you're gonna realize that sometimes your business use cases are could be very specific to your business or your, your, your company, right? Or your customer. So these are just some quick high-level ones that we put on there. Um, service application hosting, which we already talked about, right? You know, most data centers have some sort of service or application that they're hosting for uh, consumption. Now that consumption can be internal consumption only, like I'm thinking like a collaboration service like uh, VoIP, right? Some sort of VoIP service or um, some sort of IM chat service uh, or uh, some sort of uh, 
video teleconference, VTC service, right? Those are tra traditionally going to be for internal consumption. Uh, could be for external external consumption as well. Um, uh, something that would be specifically external client facing could be like a custom client web app, right? Some sort of web tier app, like a web, a three tier application with web application and, and database. That would be something that could be externally consumable. Um, the next one's consistent user experience, right? Um, we want to provide, uh, I call it quality of experience. So it's a different terminology. Uh, quality of experience, please don't get confused with quality of service. Quality of experience is everything to the user and the application, right? So it could be QoS, but it's also security. It's also compliance. It's also um, application where routing. It's a whole bunch of other factors that goes into quality of experience. Mohammed, do you have anything you want to add to those two before I keep going? No, no, I agree with you 100%. Uh, big, yeah. Um, just checking the chat real quick. Okay, so rapid and agile service creation. So Mohammed kind of touched base on this earlier, right? A lot of companies today need that rapid um, offering, right? They need to be able to instantiate something new on the fly where they don't have to wait weeks and weeks or months for the network team to do something. Um, I've actually been in companies like that in the past where uh, the development team will put a request in and the network team takes like weeks to complete the request. And the request is build out a new, you know, a new network, a new subnet. The request is build out a new VM or five new VMs, right? And it takes weeks to do in some cases. This type of data center architecture that we're talking about, you go down from weeks to minutes, right? Like, and it, it's automated, right? Mohammed, you want to say something? No, no, I was going to mention that uh, even we built a couple of data centers that um, co connected to the multi-tenancy that you have multiple customers and each customer when logging, he will find his own like uh, resources, like resource pool where he can create a VM, attach it to a firewall, publish it to the internet, uh, like drawing and then click submit. It will be up and running in seconds, not even minutes. So this is the beauty about uh, uh, programmability, about controllers, about uh, self-service. Yeah. Yeah, it really is a different world. I mean, and I'm sure a lot of you have experience with this, right? Um, this is this isn't necessarily a new trend. This has been going on for the last five to ten years now. Um, yeah. the, the new trends are the technologies that that solve this, right? Um, but the need this this business need, right? This use case, it's not necessarily necessarily a new trend. Um, the fourth one on the left side here is business continuity. So obviously, you know, keeping your business functioning, keeping things up and running, redundancy, like a disaster recovery site or uh, active active data centers or active standby data centers, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, the next one, multi-tenancy on the right and segmentation, you know, I mean, that's huge, right? From a, a, a use case perspective, um, depending on where you are and who you're, you're provisioning services for, um, applications and, and services and whatnot, you know, you could very well need a multi-tenant environment. Um, can someone tell me today what they use for a multi-tenant environment? I'll ask that question. Feel free to answer in chat or unmute yourself. Uh, we've got managed hosting, Colo. Thank you, guys. So Shinar said managed hosting. Sita said uh, Colo. Those are great. Those are great examples, right? Uh, managed hosting. So if you think of the website, like I have a website, right? My own personal website. And it, it's hosted and they're hosting it and they're keeping things kind of count, um, either containerized or multi-tenancy, right? Um, depending on how they're doing it on the back end. What else we got? We got I was going to ask you, Zig, yeah. Uh, let's say uh, you are working in a uh, enterprise or a big company. Let's say it's a food company and they are having their own, their own data center where they are running their own application and all the external users are their own employees. You don't have other uh, user other than their own employees. Do you find a need for such a company to have and uh, adopt multi-tenancy? Yeah, so that's a great question. We'll start there, right? And hopefully some of you have that, you know, in your environments. Um, I do see some value with that. And I do see a, a solution um, 
So I think it would depend on the departments and the company and any type of segregation that they would need. So I could see an example of like you could do production, like production is one tenant, but then you could yeah. do like development as another tenant. QA could be another tenant, right? And that's actually something I've done in, in real life in the wild situation um, for a company I worked for years ago. Uh, they they had a SaaS application, so um, a service uh, application that they that use their clients consumed, right? Their customers consumed. So they had a production instance of it, but then they had a development instance of it, and they had a QA instance of it, and they actually had a staging instance as well. So they had four different um, multi-tenant environments, uh, and the controls were very similar between all four. And this was about seven eight years ago. So they didn't have, um, you know, the software defined data center solutions that they have now, right? So it was all manual, it was a pain in the butt. That's a great question, Mohammed. thanks, man. Yeah, and maybe while we are discussing, we talk about why we need multi-tenancy and how, but also we can talk about to which level or which layer, for example, are you doing multi-tenancy physically? As Zik mentioned 10 years ago, people used to have a dedicated maybe rack or dedicated uh, physical uh, rack uh, now with virtualization with automation you can have multi-tenancy up to the uh, inside the server multiple firewall context uh, vrfs as as muhammad mentioned mpls vpn and take it over all the way to the cloud so now we have the flexibility to build our own multi-tenancy solution from the server to the end user and we'll talk about it next uh, if i may help you zig I think yeah, visibility, visibility and assurance is also a really important business case. As I mentioned, for top management to, to decide the, the, and uh, put the right decision, they need more visibility. So they need the, the right information to make the right decision. So that's why now visibility and assurance is becoming very critical. And I am sure all of you heard about uh, BI, business intelligence, big data, how uh, using the application and also some now some analytics they they trying to get data from the application combine it with some logs from the network uh, with logs from security and then you can give you do some analytics and trends and then can give big picture to the top management uh, to help them to decide so i believe this is also another uh, very important use case for the new trends of data center and Jake, if you want to add something here yeah, so I mean, um, let's let's talk about like nowadays, right? Uh, visibility and assurance. I mean, I don't know if everyone's heard about zero trust architecture yet. If you haven't, I would definitely look into it. Um, I have content out there if you want to look at it. I'm not trying to make a plug here by no means. If you don't know what zero trust architecture is, you need to look into it for sure. You need to know what what's in what it entails. Um, part of it is visibility. It's visibility of everything. Right, it's not just visibility of users; it's visibility of every resource and what that resource is doing or shouldn't be doing um, live and real time. So, visibility is key here. Um, what is your applications doing, right? Um, and not just for the business, but like I have customers, and I can't name names, obviously, right? But I have customers today that have no visibility of their applications, right? Like they know they have. 10,000 applications or a thousand applications, but they don't even know what their applications are doing. That's huge, right? That's a huge limitation. Um, and, and some of the solutions we're going to talk about today provide that visibility. They start to, to they start to kind of unpack what an application is doing, um, what those workflows within the application is doing. And then from a business perspective, you can say, well, that application's not supposed to be doing that. Right, that application isn't supposed to be send, sending data to the cloud, or yeah. that application is not supposed to be talking to that other application. What's going on? Um, I mean, this is a—it's a, actually a pretty big threat vector. So, if you're a security person, right, uh, applications and the visibility and assurance within the application—that's um, a huge threat vector these days. Uh, malicious people uh, compromise applications. But because we don't have visibility of what that application is supposed to be doing, it goes unnoticed. 100%. So we got the next one, self-provisioning and self-healing. So anyone have any kind of use case around that or any driver behind self-provisioning and self-healing?
There's a there's a uh, chat in here. Uh, Shannara yeah. says uh, observability is the new term picking up. I like that term. I haven't heard that yet, honestly. So observability, that's awesome. Yeah. We'll have yeah. to use that. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. Yeah, regarding so, self provision and self healing, we talk a bit about uh, how the end user, if you are example. Consider the data center like a private cloud, if you have your own private cloud, or even if you are working in a public cloud and your uh, uh, people can consume your service like Amazon or AWS and Azure and Google, they can just log in and create services on the fly automatically. Uh, Self-healing, we can touch base on it, like concept of containers when you have uh, like uh, Kubernetes and monitor the health of the one container, if it's failed, it will just reestablish a new one with the same specs. So this was like a, a dream come coming true. So self healing, <laughs> I believe, <laughs> maybe it's not hundred percent yet, but we are we are approaching day and day to the, this big dream. Yeah. So I would go even uh, another example of self healing. Like most of the software defined data center solutions out there, and I would even say software defined networking solutions, not just data center. So we'll go out like a level higher than that, right? They're going to have some functionality uh, of self, self-healing. They may not have the full end all of fixing something yet, uh, but they're going to be able to report on issues, right? Um, and it can be something as simple as, hey, the optic isn't working on this device. Um, and you might have to physically do something, but reporting on it is a big benefit that we don't see now. We don't see, let me phrase that, we didn't see years ago, right? We had no idea that something was down unless we, Got a call from a user saying, "Hey, I can't connect the internet." Um, yeah. So self-healing and self-reporting; those are huge items. Um, the business benefit here, so that's a business use case, but the business benefit is a troop multiplier. So I don't know if you've ever heard what a troop multiplier is. So um, the way I use that terminology is that um, any any benefit, any any use case that can provide my my networking team, my IT teams. Um, more time to do other things, right? So if they're not troubleshooting a problem, if they're not instantiating a service, if they're able to do some other business uh, initiatives, that is a true multiplier. Now I'm getting them to do something else when before they were troubleshooting that issue or they were deploying that service. So that, a lot of these kind of fill in, in that bucket of true multiplier. And then the last one we have orchestration automation, right? So I think that is honestly these days pretty pretty self-explanatory. But if we can orchestrate the workflows that we have, uh, the business workflows, if we can automate the tasks we have, right? I, I did a um, a study a couple weeks ago on automation and and the uh, the magnitude of completing a task, right? So if you have to go and change a setting on a hundred switches manually, how long does that take? Right, going and logging into every every switch, changing that setting. It could be something really small, but changing that setting is going to take time, right? So you go to the 100 switches. Well, if you have a system that can automate that for you, how fast is that, right? And then you scale that out. You go 100 switches, 1,000 switches, 10,000 switches, and it's it's exponentially um, a, a magnitude difference of time it takes to do something. But I'm sure everyone knows automation and, and orchestration, so I don't need to harp on it. Uh, do we have any questions on this slide before we move on? Anybody has other uh, business use cases for new data center before we move on? As we said, this is not a complete list. This is just a few examples. But yeah, if you if you feel that you have another business use case you want to add yeah, before moving to them. Yeah. All right. Feel free to, to chime in and we yeah. can come back to this slide too. Uh, so I'm going to head up to the next slide here, right? So we're going to talk about our DC new trends. Oh, we got someone said survivability. That's yeah. a good one. Thanks, Osama. I like that. Yeah. I could see that from an application standpoint and a data center standpoint, right? We care about that 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 application being available, survivable, survivable no matter what happens. Yeah, yeah. DC new trends. Um, so here's what we're going to cover today. Again, this is also the same thing. It's not an all-inclusive list. This is probably the top buckets, if you will, that are out there today that we should talk about. And, and we have a slide dedicated to each one of these. So I'm not going to go through the list here. We'll go each slide. And, and we'll do what Muhammad said here, too. We'll, 
well, what's what's the reason behind doing these? What's the design reason? What's the business use case, business driver, the impact, et cetera, right? Again, like I said, this is an all-inclusive list. If you guys have something else that you're doing, let us know. Um, and we want to talk about what you guys are doing, right? So, so the first one we have here is spine leaf. Anyone running a spine leaf architecture? I know a couple of you are moving to it from our initial conversation before we started. Um, anyone want to say that they're running a spine leaf architecture? And if so, why? It's an open ended question, right? So I'm sorry, I'm good at those. Yeah. We got redundancy in the chat. We got non-blocking, ease, ease of automation, easy uh, east, west, west traffic. traffic. Yeah, that's a good one. That is a huge one right there. Easy yeah, exactly. east-west traffic. We got scalability. Yeah. Easy to yeah. scale. These are all great, guys. Seriously, this is outstanding. Um, so a couple things I'll talk about, and then Mohammed, feel free to chime in, right? Since I'm already talking, I'll just keep going here. Um, so spine leaf, we got another one, horizontal scalability. That's a great, um, spine leaf is a very different architecture than the legacy kind of aggregation and, and distribution and, and whatnot. Right. And even the data center space, it wasn't as efficient. Um, so spine leaf, uh, adds bandwidth, right. Uh, it's, it's very predictable. Like Alu said, that's great. It's very predictable. Um, there's no single points of failure from an architecture perspective. Everything has redundancy. Right. Um, and traditionally, a, they're done in pods of two at least or four. So, you know, the diagram may not show it 100 percent, but we got, you know, usually there's two spines. Usually there's two leaves in a pod or four leaves in the pod. And then that way, those those devices that are connected to those leaves are dual home to each leaf. Right. And some sort of port channel or configuration, other other technology that's out there. So it's not like there's a single point of failure even to your device. There could be a single point of failure to the application. But the application can move from host to host, right? That's the idea. Um, another thing here in this architecture, it's fast routing, right? The whole point is to get traffic from your leaf to your spine and gone, right? Fast ECMP, like like Merrick said, routing. We're trying to get outbound. Um, from a underlay perspective, there's layer two, right? So it's not running. We're not running really spanning tree in the underlay. Um, we're not blocking any of these links. All these links are leveraged. Um, and the overlay, depending on what you're running, you can run stretch layer two connectivity. Go ahead, Mohammed. I'm, I'm good. Sorry. Yeah, I really li like all the, the comments. Actually, it's coming from business perspective, like non-blocking, scalability, serviceability, and so on. I just want to put some shade here, some lights. Why we draw it like this? Most people, when they, write, when they draw spine and leaf, so the leaves on the top may be the same leaves at the bottom. But uh, I just want to also discuss with you what's something that's really becoming uh, part of the discussion lately, what we call it three-stage clause and five-stage clause. So when we started, most of the people said we need, we don't need to use a three tier. We need to concentrate, minimize number of devices, assure number of connectivity, flexibility. So we have this uh, three stage. But also you may find when it's become very scalable, let's consider hyperscaler like Facebook and, and Google, where they have thousands and thousands, tens and hundreds of thousands of hosts connected to this close architecture. Maybe by then they will start thinking about five stage spine and leaf where you'll have your leaf you'll have spine and then you'll have super spine so it may make sense for some of the big players and again it's become like a business and requirement decision you don't just follow uh, facebook and build your data center <laughs> like with five stage just to be like a cutting edge it depends on number of hosts your kind of application latency and so on so and in addition to the the benefits and the architecture about the clause. I just thought to give you this hint about the three-stage clause. If you hear this term, and uh, versus the five-stage clause. Yeah, that that's great, Mohammed. Right. So you know, um, spine leaf. 
by a three tier spine leaf is pretty scalable, right? That's going to scale pretty high uh, depending on the hardware leverage. And again, we're being vendor agnostic. We're not specifically calling out any vendor hardware here, right? But a spine leaf architecture is the whole point is it's scalable, right? But there is a threshold when you start getting to that Facebook or Google size of a company, you need to go to that, that super spine design, right? That's just another level of an architecture that provides the same benefits. It's just a different uh, level of scalability and flexibility. Uh, there's some other comments here, right? Sarav says to maintain the subscription ratio. That's great. Um, these are all great benefits for sure. I love the interaction, you guys. Keep it up. Um, this is really meaning a lot for us too, this back and forth interaction. So anything else you want to talk about, uh, Spine Leaf? I mean, some other architectures we're going to talk about further on kind of rely on Spine Leaf. Yeah, maybe I just need to add that uh, currently, Spine leaf started in the data center. I built it myself maybe eight years now or seven years ago. And I believe now even the service providers and age, people even start thinking instead of building this uh, three tiers or the building the star where every everything is connected to a core, even the, some of the service providers start thinking at adopting this spine and leaf on their edge, maybe close to the a radio station, like an aggregation. So I believe it's uh, becoming uh, very useful for many industry. If we maybe can sum this up by our question, if you can just, we talk about many use cases and many benefits of the new trends. If you consider spine and leaf, uh, from your point of view, what do you think the main benefit uh, from business perspective, not from technical perspective, you will gain by uh, start deploying spine and leaf architecture instead of the old layer two, three tiers architecture, core distribution and access. I'll give it a minute. Is that a question for me, Mohammed? I'm sure that was a question for everyone else, right? For you and all the audience, but you, you may start. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, so so I think the one that Rob just said is right on, right? Failure domain is limited, right? Again, um, it, it's more of a pod architecture, right? Where you're you're doing layer three boundaries, kind of isolating that layer three and layer two traffic, and you're running an overlay on top of it, right? You could do some sort of flow overlay. We haven't gotten into that yet. But from an architecture standpoint, you're creating these failure domains, right? Yeah. So if something happens in one pod, it's not going to trickle to another pod or even to the spines, right? It, it's isolated. Um, the, the old architectures didn't do that very well. And so when you had a failure, a layer two failure or a layer three failure, you felt that ripple across the data center. Um, mm. If you were spanning layer two between two data centers, like a spanning tree, you know, you block a port, right, for creating loops, you lose the other link. Well, it takes time for spanning tree to reconverge. Right. If someone plugs a, a hub in, well, now you just created a massive, you know, broadcast storm and loop. So there, there's some huge benefits. Um, so for your domain was great. Anyone else have anything else? Um, so I will say the last thing we're harping on this. Um, you know, again, it's the pod architecture, right? But um, traditionally, what I've seen is a, a pair of leaves are deployed for a specific purpose, right? So yeah. maybe you have a ton of leaf pairs or pods for your uh, virtualization hosts, right? So if you're running VMware, for example, uh, ESXi hosts, right? Or, or some sort of blade chassis. Um, you might have 10 pods uh, of your leaves that are for your blades. But then you might also have um, a dedicated pod of your leaves for border connectivity to the internet or to another site, right? And so you still have a purpose for your pods. It's not like you're connecting everything to one pod. You could do that if you're small. I, I wouldn't go and dedicate, um, create dedicated pods if you're a small organization. Um, there's no reason to do that long term. Uh, but again, you want to isolate that shared fate. All right. So you want to kind of put things in, in places that make sense, if you will. 100%. Uh, and I mentioned before we start recording, uh, one of our colleagues, he mentioned that they are deploying now the SD data center, spine and leaf, and also uh, SD WAN. So maybe as uh, Zig mentioned, in such situation, maybe you can think, start thinking about dedicated leaves. We call it border leaf or WAN leaf for the connectivity, and also for your management and control. As example, 
the service server like the ACI as example or uh, or the, your management, you can maybe create a dedicated pod for your management and control. So still need to consider architecture. Don't build it like a spaghetti. Everything is connected everywhere. Also, you need to consider still spinally, but you need to put your logic uh, regarding where, what to connect where into each leap. And for and, and I believe all of us uh, know that, that we you cannot connect uh, endpoints directly to the spine. This is a bad design. This is not a clause. Yeah. yeah, so I just highlight like a pod, right? This is how I would yeah. create a pod, right? Here's a set of leaps, and they would be for a specific purpose, right? And you might have a whole identical purpose for multiple pods, but that's mm -hmm. the benefit. In, in When we get to, you know, controllers in a minute, you know, you can template the pod designs, right? So you can have a pod design for your um, virtualization um, hosting. You have a pod design for your WAN connectivity. You have a pod design for your internet connectivity or DMZ connectivity, et cetera. And I would recommend that for sure. Yeah, 100%. Maybe if we move to the next technology, I may add one really uh, business benefit. Uh, if you start talking about your CFO or your uh, management team, uh, spine and leaf actually really uh, fit into uh, controlling your capex and opex, so they will gain the benefit directly because reducing number of devices, reducing number of cable, all your devices are working. So the utilization for your investment, the return on investment will be seen very quickly with spine and leaf. So when you start start talking with business people, spine and leaf will give you direct uh, uh, return on investment. If you come for from capex and opex perspective, uh, yeah. Back to you, Zig, for VX land. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That was great, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so building on spine and leaf, right? And we're gonna kind of cover VX land here, right? So the architecture underlying topology is still the same, right? So that's why we spent a lot of time on on spine leaf. So here we still have spines and we still have leaves. And as you can see here in the in the diagram. We have our border leaf too. Just a quick show that you know, if you're going to have some sort of connectivity to a transport or to the internet, you would do a kind of a dedicated leaf for that, a pair of devices, right? Yeah. Um, but now we're talking about adding technology that's going to give you some additional benefits from a business perspective. So we have a spine and leaf. We talked about the the benefits from business for spine and leaf. Can anyone tell me or, or mention some benefits that VXLAN provides to the business? And we'll give it a minute. And so while while people are either you know typing away here, um, I'm going to throw out a couple while we're waiting. So VXLAN, and we can talk about the protocol at a high level, right? Um, we got one person, Osama, just said something. Workload migrations between data data centers. That is perfect, right? So, you know, VXLAN is one of those technologies that we talk about where we can get um, mobility between data centers, layer three and layer two mobility, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a driver to maintain subnets or IP addresses for whatever reason, um, that application can move between your data center locations, right? Uh, we got Mohammed said scalability and segmentation. We got Shinar said, Layer two reachability from any to any east to west. I like that. Hey, Shinar, could you just send that to everyone and not just privately to me if you don't mind? I'd like to show everyone the, the, the comments. Um, but those are great, right? Those are perfect. So, you know, VXLAN is going to run on top of the architecture. Um, it's going to allow some benefits. It's going to allow um, layer two uh, layer two mobility between the data centers for sure. That's number one. Um, we got some more. We got pod to pod communication, east west, V motion. Uh, Zeshen says freedom. I think that's freedom, right? From yeah. fixed IP address allocation. Yeah. So no static needs to, to have IP addresses, right? Um, these are all perfect examples. Hey, Mohammed, did you want to add anything? I'm sorry, catching off, off guard there. No, no, no. I'm, I'm really excited what, what I'm hearing. So I, even when I start hearing about VXLAN, maybe as I mentioned, almost 18 years ago, it started like trying to fix the limitation of the current network. As I mentioned, a number of VLANs is limited. You cannot extend layer too easily from one data center to another. So people start thinking about this uh, overlay technology, which regardless of whatever I underlay technology, uh, what they need, uh, the, the application people or infrastructure, they need 
IP reachability from data center one to data center two. Then they will build their own VXLAN and they don't need to go come back to the network whenever the, as example, their VLAN is stuck or they need to add a new subnet. At that point, maybe they can do everything virtualized using the VXLAN. So it's solving a lot of uh, limitation uh, inherited with VLAN and limitation onto layer two extension between two data center as addition mentioned ip addressing assignment uh, because you have flexibility with ip mobility yeah a lot a lot like if, you, if i started i will not finish <laughs> <laughs> it's going to keep going on and on and on right there's so much yeah, yeah. and this is why we see vx land so much these days right yeah. because of all the benefits it provides from a business perspective Everyone is running VXLAN. Everyone's migrating to VXLAN and other flavors of VXLAN, right? And other components of it. Yeah. Um, the last comment that I want to just highlight here was uh, from, I think it's ja Jawad, uh, industry standard, not vendor specific. That is perfect, right? So it's, again, it's a technology that's not a specific vendor technology, right? Yeah. It's vendor neutral, uh, vendor agnostic, and, and a lot of solutions out there today, a lot of vendor specific solutions use a VXLAN. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I really also like Jawad example because when we build this slide, we try to make it neutral. We could talk about something like OTV, which is a bit similar also when it's come to layer to extension. But VXLAN provide standard and provide more uh, flexibility. And as you mentioned, maybe people now start thinking as a service provider uh, have a VPN as a service provider, then VPN a VPN to VXLAN or to and whatever to have end to end. Uh, traffic steering end to end pass uh, performance and so and so on. All right. So um, if there's not anything else on this one, we're going to move on to the next one. But feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, again, yeah. I love the interaction that we're getting in chat. This is outstanding, you guys. Um, this I think makes us have a great day. Like we put a lot of content here together, and to get this interaction, this level of interaction is outstanding. Yeah, good. But before moving, I believe we talked uh, uh, at the start of this slide about the business benefits about VXLAN. Anybody, after we spend around 10 minutes talking about VXLAN, want to add uh, a benefits uh, which the business will see after deploying VXLAN? Just to get you. That's a great question. Make it, solid, make it solid and stress this information into all our minds. Um, so while while I'm waiting for those those chat yeah. messages and, and, and whatnot, I'll say like one of the items that we didn't talk about here is the controller element, right? So if I can grab the pen here and not mess this up, that's what I seem to do these days. So we have these controllers, right? And again, we're being vendor agnostic. One of the other benefits here is you can run VXLAN without a controller, totally, right? You can run it, do it manually, make changes manually, right? But when you start instantiate a controller to do it for you, uh, you get all those same capabilities and benefits that we talked about with um, on the business slide, the business use case slide, troop mul uh, multiplier, right? Um, also, you can leverage the controller to template everything out for you. I mean, there's so much benefit that you get with that. And again, that's vendor agnostic, right? Any of these controllers out there should do the same thing. They should provide those same capabilities. Let's see. Shinar um, answered your question, looks like, connect any workload to any work, any workloads, so any to any. 100%, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. outstanding, Shinar. Thanks, yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you. I will close it with just also two uh, business benefits just came to my mind. Scalability, as you can see, uh, VXLAN solved a lot of the scalability problem with the tradition uh, network solutions, uh, the legacy one, and also uh, support segmentation. Or, you know, we're trying to make our solution modular or segmented. So regardless of the underlay, are we using our own dark fiber? Are we using a service provider? Are we using uh, whatever technology to connect this data center? VXLAN on top of that, you have two different layers, two different uh, segmentation, and you are trying to uh, decouple the, these two problems. So yeah, back to you. Then. That's Anna, yeah. All right. So the next one is BGP as IGP. So I'll ask this question while I talk as always, right? So how many of you have ever tried to use BGP as an IGP? And if you didn't know you could do it, you can do it. Uh, yeah. Throw that out there, right? Um, there are some advancements or features added to BGP to allow you to leverage it as an IGP. Um, you increase the convergence time. You make it so you don't necessarily need to do a, a static neighbor 
configuration. Um, yeah. So you can do some sort of dynamic configuration, right? Um, but yeah, so I'll ask that question if anyone's ever done this before, and I'll, I'll let that stay there for a minute. Yeah. While people uh, responding to your uh, question, Zeke, I thought to play the devil advocate. So I'll <laughs> tell you, uh, uh, I just, uh, I don't mean it, but I, somebody may say it. I will never use BGP as an IGP because it's slow. It's require a lot of uh, configuration and it's complex. How would you answer me? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I kind of touched a little bit on that. So you can actually tweak BGP to make it fast, exactly. um, a lot faster than it is natively. Um, and that's some of the enhancements they've added to BGP. Um, and then also one of the other big kind of sticking points is that when you do a BGP neighborship, you have to um, statically define that neighborship with the, the, you know, the neighbor IP that you know. Whereas uh, there's some new features within BGP where you can do like a dynamic range. So a subnet, if you know in your design that you're going to do um, 100 BGP neighborships for whatever reason, you can do them all in the same subnet range and do a dynamic statement there, and it will neighbor up if they can reach those those devices. And you can configure it as multi-hop or whatever you need to. Um, and the benefits, like why would you do this, right? Why would you even do BGP as an IGP? So you're gonna get scalability, right? And control, right? IGP doesn't necessarily provide that, that level of control that BGP does. Think of all the policies you could implement with BGP and why would you need a policy, right? If you know, if you have a massive scale um, sized data center, um, maybe you had tons and tons of pods, um, you had tons and tons of, of hosts and you needed some identification of this is one data center, this is another data center, another data center, and you wanted to kind of give each data center its own ASN, um, internally and a route between them, you can create policies on all of that. And that's probably one of the biggest benefits with running BGP as an IGP is the policy level. 100%, I agree with you. Scalability because BGP is the only protocol which can uh, scale up to millions of routes. And I don't think uh, ISIS can, can build it. <laughs> <It> can. <laughs> I'm a big fan of ISIS, but not to that level. Uh, and also the most important point is that uh, control. You know, with BGP, we can control even with the non-technical or non-technical parameters. We can decide, I just want to send it to this autonomous system, regardless of the metric or regardless of the... Uh, look, uh, for OSPF and ISIS, it would be difficult. You need maybe something like traffic engineering to achieve this level, but BGP is like a built-in. Yeah. No, right on, right on. We got a few comments. I just want to quickly highlight them. Sarah yeah. said, uh, looking at scalability, ECMP, unnumbered interface, that's great. Yeah. Uh, and sorry if you can hear my dog. My dog's in the room as always. That's yeah. my, my partner in crime here. Um, we got Jawad, uh, yes, I had customers using BGP as underlay with class architecture. It differs with the implementation of service providers, also feature rich in terms of route police po policy. That's outstanding. Yeah. See, that's hitting all the marks we talked about. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on to the next one, unless there's something else we want to talk about here. Yeah, same question. Uh, if, if, I, if I'm back like a devil advocate, <laughs> uh, uh, Zig answered my question that I believe I'm, I'm now I'm convinced that uh, BGP now, B, sorry, BGP is, uh, is fast using BGP pick and next hop tracking and other things. And BGP with some new dynamic configuration can make it easy. But uh, what do you think, uh, the last one, uh, how to convince, as an example, from business perspective that uh, your current staff doesn't understand BGP? Uh, how to solve this one and how to, what other benefits uh, you can give to the business, which will try to balance this problem with the much more benefits they will give? It's a bit uh, complex question. Or <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, just so everyone knows, you know, Muhammad and I didn't ask these questions ahead of time. We're not, we're not leading the witness here. You know, he's asking these questions live. Um, so, I just want to restate as best as I can, so I understand the question, Muhammad. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm make sure everyone else does too. So, if they want to answer it, they can. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, it sounds like you want to ask here. Um, what if the devices don't support BGP? Is that? No, I mean, no. Uh, I believe what about the complexity of BGP 
that most of the people, most of the uh, colleagues working on data center, maybe they are expert in OSPF, AIGRP, and ISIS. So there will remain a challenge uh, how to assure that your staff uh, understand BGP. So if this is one of the drawbacks that the company need to invest to up, uplift your staff to use BGP, what additional benefits which can make it like uh, compensate this extra effort you will pay for as a company? No, okay, so now I understand the question. So that's always the, the hard part, right, guys? So you got to make sure you understand the question being asked. So you see how but, asked why without asking why, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I returned it back to Mohammed on, you know, what are we trying to ask here? Um, so that's a great question, right? Um, BGP is inherently more complex than an IGP. So yeah. how do you, how, what's the selling point, right? And I would have to exactly. consider all the benefits, right? Do yeah. the benefits outweigh my staff learning BGP? Right now, I would have to assume, maybe incorrectly, right? I would have to assume that my staff has some level of BGP experience. Maybe not to the experience of running it as an IGP, but definitely as like an internet architecture, right? If I have designers on my team, they should know how to architect an internet connectivity design. So they should have some idea of BGP. Um, uh, they should know uh, ASPath prepending, how to use that. They should know local preference. Um, and then obviously they should know the mechanics of BGP, right? At an underlying level, that basic understanding. So, and maybe that's maybe that's a reach. So I'll ask you guys, right? How many of you know BGP from a basic level? How many of you use BGP today at a basic level? Feel free to answer in chat or chime in on the audio. Um, with that assumption that, that they have a basic understanding, um, I don't think the uplift is that hard to get BGP working as an IGP. Right. I um, mean, it's a couple feature changes. It's not it's not like you're not doing MPLS L3 VPNs. Right. You're not doing MPLS L2 VPN. You're not doing care support and carrier in our AS yeah. solutions. Right. Yeah. Which are the things that are, are complicated, are highly complicated. Um, you're making a couple different tweaks to the BGP configuration to make BGP and IGP. Right. And that's without policy defined. And then you're adding policy, which I would assume everyone should know how to do policy from an internet architecture perspective. Did they answer your question, Mohammed? Yeah, it, it does. And I believe a couple of uh, the comments here in the chat is very correct. So Mohammed mentioned if uh, your team already using BGP as a transit, as you mentioned, Zig, I believe they need just a few tweaks to understand uh, what other parameters they can use to make uh, BGP a, a great uh, IGP. So Raf mentioned, uh, sorry if I mentioned your pronounce your name incorrectly, Traffic engineering, BGP policy, efficient use of BGP. These are really good drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking about traffic engineering. That's great. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. There was a question. Yeah, great. There was a question from Chinar. Actually, I was going to comment. Uh, if we are strongly recommend uh, BGP to be the only protocol for uh, internal IGP and transit. Uh, if I remember before the call, one of our colleagues told us that he currently have OSPF and I and BGP. So, do you really recommend to use BGP uh, for both transit? I mean, facing the internet and also as your IGP. Uh, so, for me personally, I have to have a justification why I'm going to run BGP as an IGP, yeah. and honestly, that comes down to control in my eyes, yeah. right? Um, what don't I get? Right. If I run OSPF or EIGRP or RIP even, right, whatever protocol as an IGP, um, what am I not getting because I'm doing that? And that's really the control um, in my eyes and the scalability, the high level scalability, right? I mean, to the exponential factor. Yeah. So if I have an extremely high scalable requirement and I need control and or, right, I would use both those as individual requirements. If I need that level of control, that granular control, then I'd run BGP as an IGP. And agree. And maybe and don't take our comments and go tomorrow to the network and remove, <laughs> remove OSPF and all of you deploy BGP. You have to plan it, as we mentioned. Always think about architecture. Even if you want to do some hands-on, maybe you can, uh, keep, as we mentioned, chip, chip in the night. Keep your current IGP, OSPF or EIGRP or what, regardless. Keep it running. Start deploying BGP. Make it less pre preferred. Start playing with it, make sure you are solid, understand how the traffic is going, understand if the, the traffic flow is still as expected as per the OSPF, and then give it some time and start migrating to 
uh, BGP as an IGP, but don't jump into the water without uh, <laughs> <laughs> preparation. Remember, remember, we don't make decisions without a reason why, right? Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and again, we're not, we're, there's no easy button. I want to make that very clear. There's like running VGP as an IGP, that doesn't mean it's an easy button. These are all, um, I like the, the analogy, these are all tools in your toolbox, right? You have a design toolbox at your desk, right? And you have all these different tools in that toolbox. So when it comes to the, a design situation, these are all yeah. presented to you. You can you can leverage them, right? But you have to have a justification. You can't just say, well, this sounds cool. I'm going to go run BGP, right? Mm -hmm. As an IGP. No, you, you really do need a valid justification, right? Um, and, and this is, I'm telling you, this has been the hardest part in my mindset is having that valid justification, right? I want to I want to run off EIGRP like I told you at the beginning. Like I want to run EIGRP everywhere and run away with that and just be fine. But that's not a reason why, right? Just because I like it. Another good example is just because you're studying for the CCIE doesn't mean your production environment's a CCIE lab, right? So those are those are good questions to ask. There's some additional comments that I want to highlight, right? Um uh, Jawad, Jawad says uh, if they are already adopting VXLAN, they should know BGP. And that's a great point, right? So if they're already doing VXLAN, then they know BGP. So it shouldn't be a huge uplift. Um, yeah. Also, uh, Jawad said abstraction, isolation, and protocols at different layers also helps in clear troubleshooting. I love that, right? Um, yeah, we talked about, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on another soapbox real quick, right? And I'll be quick, Mohammed. I'll try to keep quick to this. Um, we, we are designers, right? That's the whole intent. We are designers. We're trying to be the best designer that there is or the, a better network designer, whatever terminology you want to leverage, right? To become a good or better or the best designer, we have to know how to troubleshoot these protocols. Not that we have to know how to do it from a CCI perspective or a command line perspective, but we have to know the pitfalls that a protocol can go into from a design perspective. Right, so keep that in mind. That if we don't know enough about a protocol to properly troubleshoot it or know where it could be a design failure state, that we can't design that protocol. There, that's my soapbox. Okay. Um, so Rob said, looking at the traffic surge all over the globe, DC and ISP should speak seamlessly from the user perspective. BGPS protocol is 360 degree solution. I like that that point of view, sir. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Follow on to that, even as Rob said, even if I have worked on a DC design, BGP has been used as an underlay and overlay solution. I don't know if I've actually seen BGP used as an underlay and an overlay solution. Well, yeah, I have VXN and EVPN. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Somehow. that's great. Exactly. Uh, yeah, we're going to move on to the next slide. Yeah. yeah, this is, yeah, we can go to the next slide, yeah, because we are a bit behind schedule, but yeah. yeah. We I have you minutes slides, guys, so we got a lot to cover still. Um, so yeah. we're going to try to speed up a little bit, I think. So this next one is segment routing. Yeah, and I believe, yeah, so the, the comment from Solab actually is really helping here. So as we mentioned, in order to try to uh, get the maximum out of the network, we believe that uh, KISS concept, keep it uh, simple, stupid. So mm -hmm. actually when you're building simplicity, and I believe there was a, a saying I really like that uh, simplicity is more important than uh, the more important cornerstone into digital transformation. So if you want to transform your uh, company, your architecture to the future, you don't need, I believe 15 years ago, 20 years when we start working as an engineer, we always think that if I build a complex solution, this means I am a better engineer. I know how to make it complex. I know how to play with the VRF leakings and play with route target and make it very complex. Nobody else can understand it. But now this mindset is changing. You need to keep it simple, as we just mentioned. Instead of having all these uh, protocols, all this layer, we can have a simple BGP protocol running as an overlay and underlay. Similarly, if we go to this segment routing idea, it's all about simplicity. Why to have a dedicated protocol just for label distribution, which is LDP, and another protocol to build traffic engineering with these two, which is RSVP, and we know how RSVP is very complex and very consuming to the resources. So as a way of simplicity, start thinking about segment routing. Let's bring these capabilities and embed it into one of the most strongest protocol we have, it's I into IGP, OSPF, and ISIS. And also in case if you want to use BGP uh, into your data center, you can still use uh, BGP SED or BGP uh, segment routing IDs, specific, uh, and so on. So I believe 
to carry on with simplicity, with to make your solution more controlled, you can even if you are a big service provider and you want to have end-to-end -end single protocol uh, to establish your path, you can have segment routing in the data center, segment routing in the transport, and segment routing in the access. Instead of having, as example, TDM and LDP and VLANs. So can you imagine the complexity we used to have 15 years ago or so when we try to uh, do the stitching between the radio and the transport and the data center where the mobile core is hosted. Uh, I don't want to, there's, uh, as I mentioned, we are here we're trying to give you the hints and give you the mindset of a designer. We cannot explain segment routing in five, 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, but if you have a question, uh, please let me know. And then Zig also, if you want to comment about segment routing. I'm a big fan of segment routing as well. But uh, what, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll see if any questions come in, right? Um, I'll, yeah. I'll quickly comment on the comments. Um, so Shinar said, I wouldn't, I couldn't agree more with Sarav. Not generalizing here, but BGP is the way to go. I yeah. think so as well. I just, I will say, you know, everyone's been throwing um, another address family into BGP. So BGP has become like yeah. that Swiss Army knife, right? It's, it's a solve, it's a solution or technology that can solve so many different things. Um, then uh, Sarab said, this is the future. Go through uh, some hyperscale scalar design, much simpler, and um, it's much simpler, so it's scalable, right? And I like that too. That is great, right? Um, and Muhammad said, keep it simple, stupid, right? Kiss. Um, yeah. We have to always remember what we do because, you know, we're the ones that are going to be called when there's an outage, right? We're going to be the ones that are called at midnight or two in the morning on a holiday or a weekend. And we're going to have to know what we did a year ago and why we did it, right? So I, I harp on that um, when I talk about my Cisco Live presentation every year. Um, it's the same thing, right? We just have to keep it simple so that we understand why we did what we did months and months ago. Uh, the next one was... Uh, um, I, I, tac, I can't, I hope I didn't butcher your name right. Simplicity always prevails, um, as Clarence said. So, yeah, simplicity, right? We have to keep it simple. I, I am a big fan of that. There's no reason to make a complex design or solution um, that, that doesn't drive the business, right? Obviously, a business requirement is going to drive that complexity up. Um, and if there's not a business requirement, then there's no reason to make it complex. Right. Uh, segment routing. So on the segment routing bandwagon here, I'm a big fan of segment routing. Um, I think it has a lot of uses. Uh, you know, I don't think it's used enough these days. Um, so, you know, segment routing, that's a lot that goes into segment routing. So we, we're not going to talk about everything within segment routing. I'm going to talk about high level what I like about segment routing. Right. Um, so if you don't know, you can actually use segment routing um, with a software controller of some sort and actually leverage dynamic creations of paths through your environment. So think of your, your, your TE tunnels, think of um, application aware routing. You can do that within segment routing today with the controllers. Um, and that, that's a simple statement to make. It may not be as simple to implement, but the return on that implementation is twofold. I mean, it's huge from a business perspective, right? Um, that, that unified MPLS slash segment routing configuration, you can really do um, application aware routing, source specific routing if you need to. It's really a great, great solution if you are in the need of that type of solution. Yeah, you remind me also, Zig, when I'm, I'm working as an architect and trying to sell the idea of segment routing, I always, always mention that segment routing is like SDN enabler or programmability enabler. So if you can imagine that your application can start your application example, whatever application can start talking with your one SDN controller and tell them their requirement. And the SDN controller, because the network now is programmable and he understand for each pass, he has a specific SID pass, he has a binding, uh, he can build whatever SRTE. So based on that, each application requirement, this is the dream. Uh, we can push the traffic to our specific source, specific path, or we can mention some specific requirement. I only want to pass through, as example, uh, this state. If I'm living in Australia, I want my traffic only to be inside the Sydney or New South Wales. Uh, I want my traffic only to pass these links where, where we have 100 gigs of links and whatever. So this is the beauty. So this is the future. 
uh, application can start talking to the, not directly to the network, but through a controller, and they can start building their own passes based on their uh, requirements. So who else can do that? I believe it would be complex if you try to do it with uh, other RSVP, TE, and uh, routing protocol for sure. Yeah, so like the Mohammed's what he just said, right? So I want to make it kind of clear. You can have an application in your data center explain or tell segment routing how it needs to route, right? You can't do that with anything else. Everything else has to be done by a controller, but you can actually have your applications um, on your servers kind of work with segment routing, and then it can route it a certain way, um, which is extremely beneficial right um as you can instantiate that at the edge yeah 100 anyone running something routing today just curious if you are just send us a note in chat um we'll move on to the next slide if there are any questions on something routing obviously just let us know uh, we got about 15 minutes left and we have four more to go through right so all right, so some of these are going to be fairly quick and easy. So this is really just software defined data center, and we're being vendor agnostic, right? So we're not saying um, vendor specific solutions here, but we can as an example. So this would be like VMware's NSX, or it would be like um, Cisco's ACI, right? Um, and there's other flavors of software defined data center out there. There's open standards. We're going to talk about um, open daylight in a little bit. If you're not familiar with ODL, open daylight, we'll talk about that in a little bit too as an open standard um, software defined data center solution. Um, so, so at a high level, what I would say is a software defined data center solution provides a, a capabilities to a business, right? It provides inherent capabilities to that business. And think of this as not only just the VXLAN configuration we talked about earlier, or the VXLAN controller implementing VXLAN on the fly, but now we have a software defined data center that can implement application um, that quality of experience information that we talked about. So let's say you have a three tier app, a web tier, a application tier and a database tier. Um, now that's a simple tier. There's a whole bunch of other application um, architectures that we could talk about, but just being very, very simple. Um, so you have your web tier, your application tier and your database tier. Inside this controller, you can template out what that looks like, right? So now it's not a matter of just automating VXLAN, that's happening, right, under the hood. You're doing that already in the controller. Yeah. Um, but now you're adding an application layer to that controller of, okay, can what level of quality of service does this application need? What, what level of access does this application need? Does the web tier need to talk to the application tier? Yes, it does. Does the web tier need to talk to the database tier? No, it doesn't. Like, all those things are going to get pushed into the controller and pushed down. Mohammed, anything else to add to that? Yeah, I just was thinking uh, again that is the now we reach that like we are trying to combine multiple of these new trends and come up with like a framework. So we are taking the clause, the spinal leaf, hand in hand with the uh, VXLAN, hand in hand with controller, and become we, we come with this uh, SDDC. Uh, another point I like about Cisco terminology the, is application centric. So we are building our data center based on the application requirement. And I like also the concept we used like a contract uh, between, as example, the application EPG and the uh, web EPG is like a contract, like you are dealing with two parties, two human, and you write the SLA or contract what I need to consume from your uh, group and what you need to consume from my side. So actually it's becoming more humanized I, and then you can, based on that, the controller can instantiate the required uh, VLANs, VXLANs, the required uh, router if needed. I can put, like, attach some uh, firewall to my VM to control the east-west traffic. A lot of things we can do uh, with this SDC. And I believe uh, ACI and NSX is improving day by day, adding new third parties. So even I still remember with Cisco and VMware, you can still have like Paulo Alto, Firewall, F5, Load Balancer, and whatever. So it's actually uh, becoming uh, advanced uh, day and day. Just because uh, uh, to be aware of time, uh, for the previous one, I think we touched the business benefit quickly, like simplicity, like uh, operation excellence, and so on, uh, which I believe also applies here to uh, SD data center. 
uh, if you need to add uh, uh, zig what other benefits from business perspective uh, the company will gain by adopting sd data center and also our colleagues here and friends can add to the uh, chat yeah, so I think you kind of summarized it pretty well, right? I think it's the same as what we talked about before. Um, you might get some additional um, controls and policies of your applications, right? Um, that you don't necessarily have in these other solutions that we talked about. We're building on each other, right? As we go through today, we're building on the technologies that we're talking about. So if anyone else has some specific use cases they want to talk about here, let us know in chat. Um, we're going to keep moving along here. You ready, Mohammed, for this next one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> BGPLS, it's all you, my friend. It's all you. Yeah. So yeah. So BGPLS is like something walking uh, behind the hood. It's not something that uh, your application team will see or your uh, business team will be aware of. It's like a, a unknown soldier. So it will become for specific use cases. Let's say for uh, any reason, whatever reason, if you are merging multiple companies or if you are working on segmentation and you want to give uh, let's consider this is your big data center and you have your exist in multiple continents. Let's say here in Asia Pac, like in Australia, in Europe, and in US, in New York, ZIG. And you have three different uh, IGP domains. Let's say even, let's say, let's make it simple. Let's say ISIS, but different uh, ISIS domain. And uh, in order to do that, you will not be able to uh, build, a, build an end-to-end pass meeting your requirement uh, easily when you have inter domain. So that's why people start thinking, why not to take all this link state database about specific domain, all the information about the links, all the information about the device, and sent it by a, a very nice protocol who can carry whatever we want. So they start thinking, what <laughs> protocol should we use? So they thought initially about the PCE, uh, Pass Competition Engine PCP protocol. And then why they said, why not to use our old friend BGP? We can carry whatever we need uh, over BGP. We can carry Mac, we can carry access list. So uh, in this case, BGP will stop carrying this uh, uh, label uh, link state database uh, from different domains and give it back to our WAN SDN controller. By doing this, the WAN SDN controller will have a full picture of the hold three domains and can again help us to establish the path uh, from, as example, from point A to point uh, Z here. So again, it's a, a, a way to communicate information. It adds to visibility. It adds to our uh, tools to be able to uh, build the right and perfect path through our network, optimal path through our network. If you want to add something, Zig? Yeah, I'll try to add a couple things real quick, right? So, um, so BGP link states, LS is link state, right? So yeah. we're taking all this information from our IGPs, wherever they are, and we're putting them in BGP, and then BGP is sending this information to a controller. Yeah. Uh, the reason why we would do this is because we want to make some sort of decision based on this information. We want to make some sort of business intent or decision or application decision based on this information that we provide to the controller, right? And we're being vendor agnostic here, the WAN SDN controller, it's this you know, box, right? Um, we're going to show open daylight in a minute. So if you're not familiar with that, we'll give you a quick rundown open daylight, but that's actually a perfect use case here. You can do an open daylight deployment um, and it'll pull in this link state information and then you can leverage open daylight to run your, um, your flows across it. So think of on-demand TE flows. But they're not called TE flows, but they're they're called paths, right? So yeah. you can you can create these these on demand flows based on the IGP information of all these domains together. Um, which, if you don't have a reason to do it, then you don't need to do it, right? Um, but if there's a valid reason to do this, this is a lot simpler than potentially running MPLS TE or segment routing TE, right? We're talking about keeping things simple, right? We got five minutes roughly. Um, that's where I'm at with that. We have one comment uh, or question. Shinar says, does WAN SDN controller also take care of some traffic engineering in the core? Um, yes. Yes, yes, it does. That's yes, definitely, it's definitely, yes, yes. This is one of the main yeah, functionality of SDN, WAN SDN control. And by the way, maybe you'll not see this a lot uh, in your, if you're running a small data center, you will not see this complex um, uh, setup with multiple domains. 
it's mainly you will see it more into uh, service provider or if you as, as example not providing a private cloud for your own enterprise but maybe if you are a, a data centers private cloud provider maybe in a, a country or so on or working with one of the public uh, cloud providers um so i'm going to move on to the next slide but i'm going to say a couple of things right so yeah. you may not see this muhammad said right i intend to actually create a couple of videos on bgp and open daylight. We'll see if we actually get around to doing it. I'm vocalizing it here so I keep myself accountable. So Mohammed can help me if I don't do it in a month. But the mm -hmm. intent here is I want to build out a lab environment that shows BGP LS. The lab environment is going to be as real world as possible. That makes sense, right? And then the intent is also to deploy open daylight controller on top of that, right? And show some of those workflows, right? Um, so here's number seven, open daylight controller, also called ODL. <laughs> Uh, this is the architecture of the controller, of how things work, and we're not going to go into the ins and outs of how the information flows between the different elements of the open daylight controller. The intent here is that this is a this is an additional controller than like a vendor specific controller, right? So this isn't a Cisco controller, this isn't a VMware controller. This is technically an open standard controller that you can pull down and run um, right now if you wanted to. Well, did you have anything else you wanted to add here? No, no, I know that you are, yeah, you have a tight time schedule. So yeah, it's like uh, we mentioned in segment routing and you can use uh, one in controller and in the previous slide in BGP LS. So this is one of your options. So if you don't want to uh, be vendor locked down or use one or uh, use one of the existing vendor solution, you can go for this open source, open daylight uh, it support uh, BGP LS, it support uh, PCE, it can communicate with SR with the uh, normal routing protocol. So I believe it's uh, yeah, a good option uh, for open source. Again, open source uh, for big companies, maybe the challenge is what about the support? What about if I hit some yeah. a problem with ODL? Who can, uh, can fix it? Shall I train my team and do it in-house? Or can I try to find uh, like what we call it the... Uh, uh, a distribution or uh, maybe like a Red Hat or whatever uh, uh, for this ODL to get the support. So this is one point to consider when you start using uh, open source uh, applications. Last but not least. Yeah, last but not least, right? And I have time, so I'm not tied up to the hour. I was more trying to be mindful of the people on the call. So I have a few more minutes after eight o'clock my time in the morning here. Um, so yeah. if there's questions or comments or people want to stay on for any reason, I have about 15 more minutes that I could stay on for, just so everyone knows. Go ahead, Mohammed. Yeah, here just we start with a question. Uh, how you can compare why people moved from physical uh, servers to virtual machine? So this was in historical, maybe 20 years or so. And now people moving from VMware to uh, containers. So do you see? Similarity about the reason moving from physical route, physical, uh, sorry, I'm still a network guy, physical <laughs> servers to VMware and now moving from VMware to containers. Is there for the same reasons or do you believe there's something else happen uh, which uh, start pushing people to use new technology? So I think there are some some similar reasons, right? So, you know, going physical to, to virtual, right? You, you save money, right? You save a ton of money. Yeah. Right, you're not buying physical devices anymore. You're buying your host, and now you have tons of VMs on that host, whatever form of those VMs are. Mm -hmm. um, this is the same idea with containers, right? So now you can build out a VM, but then you can put a ton of containers on it, right? Mm -hmm. So that website example earlier, my website is most likely a container on a VM that has 100 websites on it, right? Yeah. That's the idea of a container um, for me, you know, how it would work perspective. Um, you're going to get that that OPEX and CAPEX um, um, investment increase, right? You're going to get that increase on your savings and potentially increase on revenue, right? So a decrease on spending, increase on revenue, right? Which is good for a business. Um, some additional factors, uh, containers provide some additional security elements that, that VMware's just, you know, the VMs just didn't, right? So now you can build out a VM you can put containers on it, and those containers are now 
segmented if you want them to be segmented, right? You can keep their isolated, their data isolated, but it's still on the same VM or same device. Um, it's all containerized within that VM. I'm using the definition in the word. I'm using the word in the definition, containerized, mm -hmm. but that's the idea. It's compartmentalized in the VM. Um, some additional ideas. Uh, containers are a lot easier to spin up, right? Yeah. You can spin them up on the fly really quick. We're at eight o'clock. So um, those are some quick benefits. Anyone else have anything else they would like to add to the benefits? Yeah. yeah. Also, while waiting for our friends here to add, so as you can see here, the drawing that with VM, you are losing a lot of resources for the guest OS. So we have the hypervisor and we have the, the main operating system for the host itself. But for each VM, we have this guest OS, we have the library, and then we have the application, and we need to take care of the OS, batch it, uh, upgrade it, whatever. So, and the container simplify this. So instead of you have a server, instead of having only six VM on this physical server, you can uh, increase your utilization and use 20s or tens of uh, uh, containers on the same physical device. And I believe that it's coming like a mental, uh, again, mindset uh, shift. So instead of treating your VM like a pet, where you need to take care of your pet, feed it every day, uh, make sure it's clean, <laughs> and <laughs> like a uh, uh, cat and dog, and he has to attend with us the seminars and feel happy. So you're actually trying to take your application and infrastructure as a herd. So you don't really care about the docker, if, uh, sorry, about the container. If one died, you can just, if one is not feeling uh, well, you can just uh, leave it to die and instantiate a new uh, container. One of the things which I really uh, was surprised when I heard it a couple of years ago, that even Google, when start talking about Kubernetes and containers, they said that for each of your search requests, they instant, uh, instantiate a new container just to respond to this uh, search request. Can you, can you imagine how fast is it to work with containers? So for each search request, which are, are billions over the years, they are using this with containers. And just to highlight another point, then we can have Docker, like your ASXi, to manage the host. And if you have a cluster, you can start having your Kubernetes as a control plane to who understand each data center capabilities and start dividing and hosting the application and the container based on the specific requirement and the health of each data center. And as I mentioned, when we started, if, as example, this uh, pod failed, he can, in few milliseconds, can, in few seconds, can start a similar uh, container in another data center and so on. So it's ac actually trying to achieve the self-healing uh, promise or dream. No, that's great. I'll add one last comment here on on like the uh, the the control plane aspect of these these containerization solutions, like Kubernetes, OpenStack. Um, there's a number of solutions out there, right? Um, yeah. A lot of these solutions actually manage all of the infrastructure components, right? So they have plugins to manage storage. They have plugins to manage network. They have plugins to manage um, uh, OS whatever OS is running, hypervisor, et cetera. So if you're not familiar, you haven't played around with Kubernetes or OpenStack or any of those other you know technologies, a lot of them have those plugins. Um, they can be a little complex to run, like OpenStack can be a little complex, but um, you get a lot of return on that complexity um, from the value here, just so you know. 100%, yeah. Yeah. So we're over on time. I, we got still people on the call. So, you know, I'd like to open it up to any more questions you guys might have. Um, you know, we're at the thank you page here, and I'll go to that next page here so we can see it. Oh, I'm going to stop using my mouse. Um, anyone have any questions, comments, concerns, anything that you want to talk about? You know, we're still here, so we can talk about anything that you have on, on your mind. Um, that's what we're here for. And then uh, um, while you guys are writing down your questions in chat, I'm assuming that's what you're doing right now. Um, you know, any feedback, right? Did you guys like this session? Was it good? Did you like, did you hate this session, right? If you hated it, let us know. Um, hopefully you didn't hate it. Um, hopefully you did like it. Um, I would add, if you liked it, tell us what you liked about it, right? Like what, yeah. what did you take away from the session, right? Yeah, and, and usually uh, even in my trainings and my sessions, I ask people, 
what are the areas of improvement? So I've been working with Zig for the last three session and also have a couple of series about uh, cloud 5G, which was also very successful. Uh, so what, what, how can we improve this uh, session more? And what you want to hear in the future for the upcoming session? So if you can write this or even unmute yourself and tell us how to uh, improve it even better. Yeah, we're getting some great comments. Um, so I'll just try to read them off while we're doing this. Uh, we have a question, so maybe you can answer this question. Uh, Alou said, is there any STN commercial solution using segment routing today? Um, and I'll just go through here. So uh, Shinar says, thanks, Mohammed and Zig. Great refresher. Jod says, thank you guys for putting this together. This is a very beneficial overview and business drivers for these technologies. Merrick says, great session. Thanks to both of you. Sita says, thank you for the information, uh, informative session. Good overview. Uh, Mohammed says, very informative. Thank you uh, both. And uh, Islam says, thanks, team. Uh, actually, if it was boring, we wouldn't spend one and a half hours. <laughs> thanks, guys. Yeah, so I was being a little um, uh, sarcastic, I guess, with that statement, right? If you guys are still on, then you guys are enjoying it, right? So thanks for that. Um, and then Rob said, thank you, Zig and Mohammed. This is a very good session. Yeah, thank you, Zig, again. There was one question from Alu, if I... Uh, understand your question correctly uh, about uh, segment routing and SDN. Um, here I'm, I have to be vendor specific. So yeah, Cisco, they have some solution that uh, uh, for uh, as an SDN um, communicating with SR, especially for service provider, you know, they have um, uh, NSO way and they, now they combine it under the umbrella of uh, Crosswork. So Crosswork is like the SDN controller for uh, using the segment routing to establish the pass end to end, and uh, they also use telemetry to complete this closed loop with the uh, real time visibility from the network. So yeah, uh, there are some vendor. I believe also Juniper they have um, uh, Contrail and North Star, but uh, at the beginning Juniper was not a big supporter of uh, Sigma routing for the previous five years, but now they are still they are back on it because they are more into SRv6. They don't want to go directly with SR MPLS. They believe we should jump directly to SRv6. So this is uh, uh, Zig. Do you have other use cases or? Um, so you know you, you have some good. The Cisco use case was pretty good, right? That was yeah. something that they've been working on for a while, yeah. and they added um, pretty recently in public. Public um, announced it to the public. Um, I, I, I believe I, I'm going to be talking out of turn here. So I think ACI might in the future, yeah. um, if it hasn't already, um, the new version of ACI is going to have some additional features to integrate with segment routing. Um, but I have no knowledge of that. I'm assuming, right? So I'll make that very clear. Um, I have no prior knowledge of that. I'm, I'm thinking that's where it's going. So it's a, that's just a viewpoint, a personal opinion. Um, so yeah. The, 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 the question? Yeah, uh, I was going to say, sorry to interrupt. Zig. I was going to ask Alu if this answered his question. Yeah, we'll see if he responds back on that. Um, we also got another question from Sita saying, would you suggest any further reading materials? Well, it's a, it's a big list of technologies. So <laughs> each one of them, maybe you need to read one or a couple of books. So there's a very nice book about uh, policy-driven ACI. Uh, Sigma routing. There are the two books written by uh, Clarence uh, Filfis uh, uh, about SR and SR uh, traffic engineering. Um, Open Daylight. You can study uh, Open Network Framework, and you have certificates. What else? Uh, <laughs> a lot. Of documents. Yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch. Okay, okay. so. I would recommend a couple things. Um, uh, so, I mean, I hate to plug myself, Muhammad, man. I hate to do it, right? But mm -hmm. um, I feel like this is one of the best resources you can go to. Um, Cisco Live, right? Cisco yeah. Live has a bunch of content every year. It talks about a number of these technologies, VXLAN, segment routing. Um, yeah. I mean, we talked about a lot of things today, spine leaf architectures, et cetera. Um, I do a, a network design focused um, session list for Cisco Live. So, you know, right now Cisco Live is going through a digital um, rotation of sessions getting um, published because of all the things happening in the world with COVID-19. So um, 
June was the first um, publication. About 200 sessions went live in June. Um, in July this month, a couple weeks ago, about 250 sessions went live. And then the third release is going to be in September. I don't know the number of sessions are going to go live in September. Um, but I have done a kind of correlated list of the network design sessions that you should focus on. So I've gone through all the sessions I've posted so far, and I've highlighted the ones that you should you should follow. Um, so if you if you go to that 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 link, I can send it to you if you want. Um, I actually have a VXLAN session that you should follow, a segment routing session that you should follow. And again, this isn't my content, right? I just did the blog post and the YouTube video. This is Cisco Live content that you should consume, and it's free, right? It's all free to you. Yeah, great. Uh, that is, thanks for that, Dick. And please make sure to watch this uh, Cisco Lives. I believe it will be perfect. And read these books. Maybe we'll try to prepare a list and share it with you. So we got your emails. I believe there was a, another question from Shinar about uh, if Sigma routing support all uh, features uh, available by RSVP TE. It depends on vendor Shinar. Uh, some of them, when we started, source routing was there from day one. Some of the constraint-based routing, constraint-based yeah, uh, was already there, but some specific bandwidth uh, reservation was not there. And some of the vendor now is working to support this natively on SR. So not 100% so far. The protection is there, source routing is there. Some of the business, uh, the bandwidth, sorry, the bandwidth reservation, so it's almost 11, <laughs> reaching 11 p.m. here in Sydney. So I'll start losing my words. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the second question uh, to you, Zig, cloud native data network from Dinesh. Da? Oh, yeah, this, yeah, this is a really good resource, cloud native data center networking. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, I think it is. It's a good resource. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah, yeah, yeah. a statement, though, right? I think he's just stating, I think it's a good resource, but I could be wrong. Uh, um, so, uh, and then Sita said, please share the list. I just put it in chat real quick and I'll say it out loud real quick. So the first blog post I did, and again, I, I'm not trying to harp on my stuff. It's just a correlated list, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a zigbits.tech slash 51. Um, if you go to that link, it'll go to that, the first listing. And um, I'm working on the second listing for July. So if there's something that you're looking to see, just reach out to us. We'll let you know on what you can leverage um, trying to create a listing of content for you to review, right? All right. Hey, I want to say thank you all so much. Um, and this is extremely interactive, and that's what I like. I personally love it to be interactive. I think Mohammed does too. I'm talking for you, man. I'm sorry. Um, we had so many questions, and I think we've answered every question today. We've gone over. Um, if anyone needs anything else, you know how to reach out to us. We're on socials, right? We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, et cetera. Feel free to reach out to either of us anytime. Good. Thank you again, Zig, and I totally agree with you. It was one of the best session we had because mainly because of you. You make it very interactive, your comments, your questions, your notes. Thanks again, and uh, as mentioned, please follow us. And if you really uh, enjoyed this session, subscribe to our YouTube channel, spread the knowledge, and let us know what you want to hear on the next session, which I believe most probably it will be between data center and public cloud. But if you have a specific uh, topic, uh, please share it with us. Thanks again. And Thanks, guys. Uh, have a good uh, day and weekend. See you guys. Have a good one. Bye.